Okay, so we're going to uh, we're gonna we're gonna review. You know, we're gonna go back to the EKG, review because that's sort of where we left off. Start to incorporate information and uh, add a little more information. And really, the end of this chapter, uh, which is what we're gonna put in, is basically setting us up for the biggest thing of next chapter, which is the hardest chapter, the most basic or let's say the foundation of this next chapter, or this next test, which is blood pressure. And so we're going to, uh, you know, we're going we're to skip parts of, of that chapter temporarily so I can get to a major, you know, like the major concept, the, the thing which we're going to fill up the board, sort of understand blood pressure control so that at least for the first time before the weekend, you can kind of get this information down and start learning it. Because once you learn what we're going to put up on the board from chapter 15, it's going to be basically helping you throughout the course, especially for this test and beyond. You're going to see not only what we put up there is going to be a 14, 15 point essay question on the next test, you know, which we'll see a lot of information. You'll use that information to answer 25, 30 more points, you know, that, that are there. And it's going to be the critical thinking type of things. Okay, so really, really important. This is why, this is my second favorite day, second favorite day of the course. And so it's a really good day. Uh, and I realize, you know, people, some people have lab quizzes and you're sort of distracted, but you're going to have to, to uh, refocus uh, for temporarily while we'll do this. And then, you know, you'll have time to, to sort of regroup for that and to take the, the lab test. You can have as much time you want in the lab, but it's not going to take you, know, you that long to do it. Uh, it's not going to take two and a half hours to do it, unless you really want to take two and a half hours to do it. Okay? So, but we're going to, because one of the basic things that has a lot of information that we did at the end that's really, you know, you need to sort of get pretty quickly too, is the EKG and all the information that we're sorting, uh, we're starting to associate with this. And the EKG itself is measuring just electroactivity going through the heart, reaching the skin, so we understand what electrical events are happening in the heart. But below it, we're starting to actually, you know, coordinate a lot of the physical events that are happening. And that's why it ends up being a very important piece of information. And so, again, we'll, we redraw it here. Actually, let me get it pretty high up. In fact, let me get some space here. So we have P, QRS. I'm going to give us a little extra room for T. And then, let's make sure I go maybe up to here. P, QRS, and T. So, again, we'll just put this, we will measure next, starting next week after the lab's done, so a week from today for those people. You'll be measuring, you'll actually take your EKGs and this, the machines, wow, what happened to this nodal delay? The machines work really well, so you'll see all of these waves. So, PQRST. The words are up there. This is the electroactivity going through the heart, where the P, this is not depolarization, repolarization. This is just a measure of electroactivity. This is the, uh, me the, the depolar basically the, the electricity created by the depolarization of the atria. The QRS is the electrical uh, signals created by depolarization of the ventricles, and then sort of the resetting or repolarization of the ventricles are shown in this. And that's what typically... Uh, shows up on an EKG. EKGs are incredibly complex depending upon where you put the leads and if you really look into it, it gets like way crazy, way crazier than me. But we're right here. Okay, PQRST. Now we start coordinating events uh, or things associated with it. And one of the first things, you know, the visions I want us to make, segments, is sort of it, from the end of P to Q. And this represents AV nodal delay. If we, again, I don't have that picture right handy, so I won't do it, but if we, we sort of remember the pathway starting with the SA node is what basically um, causes the heart, normally is the pacemaker of the heart. You know, eventually it's going to spread to the atrial muscles, and then we have this AV node between the atria and ventricles uh, in which it slows down a bit because we want to then make sure before the signal starts spreading up to the ventricles from these Purkinje fibers, so we're going to squeeze from the bottom, we want to make sure the atria contract and then the ventricles contract. 
And so that was the, you know, the slowdown was at the AV node. And that, for the EKG, that basically represents, again, the end of P uh, to Q. And that's what I want us to know as the AV node will be like. Well, we did heart blocks last time, and I will go to that. Uh, well, you might see it. You saw we start to have some, some distance between that, and you can actually have a blocked uh, kind of show this. For, for just just to, to, to reiterate the importance of this, if this is the AV normal delay, and we, so here's the end of P to Q, for heart blocks, we have some sort of damage here. So we're not communicating as, as efficiently between you know, the, the atrium and the ventricles, and that's what a block is, and there's all kinds of degrees. But just to kind of show the importance of this, why I, this is the one we're going to want to know for the test, not just in general, any block. But if you look at these, you see this AV normal delay of a couple of units here, a couple of these divisions, and then it's like three or so of those, and then it's four or so of those, and then you have a P without any QRS. You, know, you have a drop beat because you've lost communication. So that's sort of why that kind of get AV nodal delay is sort of you know, an important concept. And then it resets, at least for this one. Let's go back. Now, these are the two. Do I have my yellow chart? These, the, the next segment I'm making divides up the heart, the, basically a heartbeat from R to R into two segments. So this is electroactivity, and you know, corresponding to that will be the physical activity of contraction and relaxation. And, you know, the atria are going to contract around here, and they, they're going to go in diastole, but I don't want to mess this figure up. We just are going to concentrate on when the ventricles are contracting, systole, and the ventricles are relaxing, diastole. And the best way to do this is, is we're going to take a line from R to the end of T. Okay, the end of T. Uh, and that's going to represent, basically, as the electroactivity goes through the ventricles, it's going to spread out and cause contraction. And so this period is going to be, again, ventricular systole contraction. And one other, one other thing I want to put on this, I want us to realize that's when we're pumping out blood, because that's going to become important today. Go ahead. What's the space between the AV nodal delay and where the ventricular systole happens? Mm, it's nothing. Oh. Well, I mean, it's... You mean like here to here? Mm -hmm. It's Q. <laughs> so it's we're, we're not we don't we don't we're not going to call that anything. We're only identifying certain segments within oh, okay. within the EKG. So we want to know that segment, and then we want to know basically these two segments of when when we're going from R to the end of T. That's going to represent contraction or systole. As soon as we're done contracting, we're going to this is ventricles. We're going to relax until the next R when we contract again. And so from T to R, the next, the next half of that beat, that's ventricular, and then I'll, I'll, I'll answer your question back there too, ventricular diastole, which is relaxation, and filling with blood becomes really important today. That's what's happening during this entire time, that starting from the ventricles up, the heart is filling with blood. And so we're dividing the heart beat into two segments, you know, corresponding to ventricular contraction, relaxation. Uh, uh, yeah, I was just wondering, I, know that I think you said it, some of the drawings would be different, maybe in the book and this, but on the previous one when you were talking about the skid's heartbeat, it seems like right after the P wave, it goes up and then goes down versus yours is opposite. Uh, I'm not quite sure what we're saying. The, the tan one that was talking about, this, like the normal and the slow. So, this one? Yeah. yeah. You have a P wave, and then it goes up, and then it goes down. Wait. Oh, because of the link. The link will back. Oh. Tell me, I mean, I'm not confused. We this have P, Q, or S, T. So Q, R, S. T. And I'm then here's your next P wave. I'm just talking about the Q, R, S. I was just wondering why this Oh, wave. this? Yeah. You mean whether, whether there's a down right. slope on this? Yeah, that's... That, that, that varies on the EKG, and I don't know how to interpret all those as far as, as, far as that goes. Yeah, because it seems like they're drawn a little, like, differently yeah. all over the place. And, and they sometimes are. Sometimes it's first, and then it's later, like well, it doesn't matter. Well, there's no first. I mean, I there, there, first. there's QRS. It's just whether, whether the, you know, whether the, uh, or, oh, I see, because I put the Q, whether, you know, 
sometimes you'll see, like you see on that one, right, it has, you know, QRS, both of them are below. So, yeah, that's, you know, how far it's deflected doesn't really matter. You know, so it just, it just this complex sort of QRS is shown there. Okay, I don't know if that helps. Yeah. If you look at really good easy, yeah, those, those kind of vary a bit, but it is sort of the QRS sort of complex. Like when it does it, Okay, so here you see them there. They they have that. They have a downslope there, and do they? So they do two downslopes. So yeah, QRS. But it's a it's a good point of uh, that I might not draw quite. This should show it basically that way too, right? Yeah. So it's really I just I just do it pretty quickly, but it is sort of both are going down, I guess. But I might not do it that way. But it's a good point. Uh, so, but, but overall, since I don't care about QS as far as divisions go, we're kind of going from R to the end of T, and then T to R. That's sort of how we're dividing it up. So, ventricular systole, ventricular diastole. And that's the first six things that we kind of get. All right. Then, and we're going to add, we're going to add four <coughs> bullet points of what other events are corresponding to basically these places, R and the end of T. And I, I want to one more time emphasize, uh, and then you're just going to listen to me, that if you, even if you look at the, we'll have to see which version of the text, our different, our different textbooks, you know, sometimes these divisions are slightly different. So you'll see sometimes systole might just go to somewhere a half or two-thirds of T, and they've got reasons for that, et cetera. But, but for us, we're, you know, I'm, I didn't just make this up because it was easy. I mean, I, I have sources, okay? But so there's variations here. But for us, this is the key. This is what we're looking at. We're going from R to the end of T, and then, of course, then T to the next R. So we're doing it right there. So these points are really important. That's where... Uh, again, you review all the... I mean, why is this always off? Okay, that's close enough. Uh, you review all these on your own. Again, this thing was just kind of showing you what happens, but I don't care too much about it. Uh, the end, okay. And we have this idea. So all this was setting up for this, to add a couple of these very important points. And this is what we left off last time and what we're going to do to start off today. So we're following, because what you want to do with this as we do this, is not simply memorize these things. You want to start, you know, using some videos and using these diagrams to visually see that you, you see these events happening and what's corresponding. And so it's not just memorizing four bullet points. You want to see that this makes sense, that all this is happening there. And so if you follow this, I actually like looking at this while I'm doing this, that we're kind of taking the cycle here. We're really concentrating mainly on the ventricles, by the way. But when we're, we're in late diastole, Remember, this entire diastole, we're filling with blood. And you can see from this kind of idea that, that once you hit diastole, once the ventricles relax, blood doesn't go into the atria and then squeeze out here. It's filling from the bottom up because the AV valves are, are open. And so we're filling, 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 filling. You know, the atria will contract to basically uh, get 25% or so more into the ventricles that, you know, that aren't there yet and fill it up. Okay. Now, now we come to our part, what we concentrate on. After that happens, of course, we have that slight delay, and then the ventricles are going to contract. Now, when the ventricles first contract, before it's enough pressure to actually pump blood out into the arteries, we create just enough pressure to close those valves. Remember, the whole purpose of the AV valves were to be prevent backflow of blood into the atrium. So right as we begin to squeeze, we don't have enough pressure to actually get anything ejected yet, but enough pressure to close those valves. And so we call this term, because the volume is not changing, isobiomic ventricular contraction. It's the very beginning of contraction. And so the very beginning of contraction, the AV valves shut, and we hear... Love. Love, the first heart sound. Okay, so, and so, and so all three of these things go together, but guess what? They also correspond to a place on the EKG. And that place is? 
Where is the very beginning of, of contraction, the very beginning of systole? R. R. That's why, and we're going to add a fourth one in a minute. That's why these three events are also corresponding to R. So we have the term isovolumic ventricular, and I'm not going to totally spell it out, Volumic, isovolumic ventricular uh, contraction, okay, because you have it there. That, but then you, but then you have the idea. Yes, that corresponds because I already know that. Uh, that means the AV valves are shutting. So that's AV valves shut. And we all remember AV valve shutting is the first heart sound. So R corresponds to the beginning of systole, and all three of these events correspond to the beginning of systole. And that's why all that's at R. Okay. So we continue. Okay, now we're going to actually push with a little more force. And so we're actually ejecting into the arteries. Again, we're doing systole now, pumping out blood, ejecting the blood. Okay? And so we squeeze and we pumped it out. Now, do we want to stay in tetanus? We're going to have to. Relax, or diastole. Now, the very beginning of diastole, and again, we already know this. We just squeeze the blood out. We're going to relax. Do we want the blood to come back into the ventricles? No. So who's going to shut? Semilunar. And that's going to create? Dub. So the very, very beginning okay, of relaxation, before any other bloods come in, we're going to have just enough pressure relief to close those valves and create the second heart sound. Here's the semi-lunar valve that we can see here. Uh, and again, that term, because we're not changing any volume yet, no blood has entered yet, we just started to relieve the pressure, uh, we call that isovolumic, you know, it hasn't changed, ventricular relaxation. And it corresponds to those two events. And so then we go to this. This is again the very, very, very beginning of diastole, which is at? T, the end of T, as I've grown it. Because that's the very beginning of diastole. We've, we've done systole here, now we relax. The very beginning of that is going to correspond to dot, dot, dot. Okay? Isovolumic ventricular relaxation. And you know, it's spelled up there. Which corresponds to closing of the semilunar. So, semilunar valve shut. and the second heart sound. And then make sure you've got a space, because in a minute we're going to add a, a, a final sort of bullet point to, to both of those uh, places <coughs> on the EKG, R and the end of T. Just to reiterate, so ventricular diastole is going to begin at the beginning of T? The end of T, right? End of T. End, end of T, okay. Because it's the end of RT Yeah, that. exactly. And that's important that we see that because, uh, yeah, we're not doing anything in the middle. It's exactly right. So we divide the whole heart rate into two segments, you know, and that corresponds to it. And then we're back to another R. Okay. Now, what we're going to be doing, this, this end of this chapter is basically setting us up for, for the big thing of next chapter. That's the big thing for today. And so right now, we're going to define something here. And to do it, while I'm doing it, I'm going to be using it as part of a picture we're going to see in the next chapter, in which we're just going to use this again. So I want to introduce this you know, for a few minutes and then really go to that part of the next chapter that we're going to use it a lot. So the reason I'm saying this is I'm going to show you kind of a cartoon here. Okay? And kind of do this. So I'm going to draw the heart. Okay, it'll be a happy heart. Okay, we'll have the heart. And it's pumping out blood through the aorta. So we're looking at systemic circulation right now. And I'm going to make a little balloon here. Okay, and I'm going to have some veins. Coming back, 
Someone's laughing at my artwork. So this balloon, by the way, you know, when we're pumping blood into the aorta, into the arteries, this is going to represent how much blood is there, or actually our blood pressure. That's why we're going to draw it as balloon, because we're going to talk about things which control, increase blood pressure or decrease of it, or decrease it. And so we're pumping out blood, and the blood we're pumping out into the arteries, <laughs> how much is going to be this important term, cardiac output. Okay? Cardiac output. How many mils per minute are we pumping out there? Okay, the, uh, and, we're, and I'm going to come to that formula over there. Just to kind of get us oriented, although we're not talking about it yet, you know, as these arteries sort of get narrower, narrower, they're going to be called arterioles. And we'll see a better picture of this. And again, this is going to go to the capillaries, tissues, etc., before we get to the veins. But I'm drawing that some some sort of restrictions here, because we're basically going to see that we can help control blood pressure over here by either causing constriction of these arterioles or dilation. Okay, and again, we can already figure out what's going to happen. If we constrict these arterioles, maybe we can, what's going to happen to blood pressure, do you think? Increase. Increase, right? We're filling up the balloon. If we need to lower blood pressure, we dilate and the blood will go. And that's kind of coming up. Right now, we're just going to introduce this half, because when we talk about cardiac output, it actually has a couple components. And so, in fact, let me we'll use all this, because I mean, the veins are coming back, but I want to actually put, put it over here, so we realize that <laughs> cardiac output is here, but we're going to put cardiac output, CO, it's influenced by two things. Heart rate, that makes sense, beats per minute, okay? You're beating, your heart beats staying faster, it's going to put more blood out. But, here we're introducing this other concept, SV or stroke volume. Stroke volume is how many mils is being ejected per beat, you know, per stroke. Now we're going to see we have a lot of ability to control stroke volume separately from heart rate. And that becomes, you know, important. If we increase how much we put out per stroke, we basically can increase cardiac output as well. Okay, cardiac output, heart rate times stroke volume. Heart rate makes sense to us, right, if our be heart beats faster. But the idea of stroke volume we're going to see, and even we will talk about athletes and how they train or anybody, that, you know, you could be, let's say it's, it's me out of shape and me in shape, okay? So, or just someone out of shape, because I'm actually in shape. i got a double century coming up Saturday, 200 mile bike ride. I haven't done that in 23 years. So, if I don't make it back, it, uh, I don't know who my sub will be. Uh, but so I've been training a lot, so I'm in pretty good shape. But the idea is, let's say before I'm training, and if I have to get from here to here, okay, to, to create enough cardiac output to do it, I'm going to be basically squeezing my heart, heart rate, but not much is going to come out per stroke. So it's going to be... And I'll have a cardiac output. But in, 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 the, in the lab portion uh, next week, I'll talk about how this happens. But if you train aerobically... You know, you have a lower, and we all know that, right? Athletes have a lower heart rate, right? A lower resting heart rate. They don't have to because ha beat as much to create cardiac output because their stroke volume has increased greatly. So now to get over there, okay, I hope if I'm trained okay, although I can ride today, so I don't know. But the idea is to get over there. Now I can just go whoosh. whoosh. I can have a lower heart rate, but I'm going to be ejecting a lot more blood per beat. And so a heart's much more efficient. So cardiac output can increase. You can have a lower heart rate, but by, by being in shape, and we'll show you how later, you can have a greater stroke volume and therefore be able to do the same amount of work and, you know, and save your heart. Uh, but the key right now is realizing both of these contribute to that. You know, the beats per minute and the stroke volume or how much per beat. Now, words here... And this is going to make sense before we're done in 45 minutes. But right now, there are letters. When we look at stroke volume, we've got to put some things underneath it. Stroke <coughs> volume, which is how much we eject, has two components. It's basically what we put in minus what is left after we contract. And so, and so let me just write these here under. Stroke volume is going to equal, and I'll explain it, the end diastolic volume minus the end systolic volume, which is basically going to be what we have in the heart minus what is left after we contracted, that's going to be the stroke volume or what we eject. 
If 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 we, if we put in 140 milliliters, and after contraction we have 60 milliliters, that means our stroke volume that we ejected was 80 milliliters. Now let's look at those two terms more closely and why we're going to actually use this to help us what that means. So stroke volume, we're going to show you kind of why as well. Stroke volume is, okay, well, clearly what are we going to do? We're going to fill, up with, fill the ventricles and fill, you know, with blood, okay? And when do we do that? When do we fill? The end of... Well, when, when we're filling is diastole, right? Filling, 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 filling. And so we want to know, okay, right before we contract, again, filling, 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 right before we contract, how much blood was in there? Okay? That's why when we're looking at this, we're seeing how much is in, that's at the end of diastole. Okay? The end of diastole. And the end of diastole is where? The beginning of R. Again, it doesn't matter if you do it over here or over here. We're kind of, we're, you know, we're doing all that. The end diastolic volume, how much we actually end up putting in before we contract, we're about to contract, that's where it corresponds to. And that's what we need to know to help figure out stroke volume. We need to know how much did we put in, you know, before we're going to beat out that time. During that diastole, how much did we fill? And to get that number, well, you know, for us to get it, not to actually, you know, physically measure it, but that represents the EDV, what we put in. Okay? So we're filling, filling, filling. Again, we're going to start over here. Filling, filling, filling. And we have that end diastolic volume. Now what are we going to do? We're going to push it out. Okay, when we do that, do you think we get every mill out? No. No. So there's something left. And so to figure out how much is left, well, this is systole. At the end of systole, we should measure what that is, the end systolic volume. Whatever that is, you know, whatever's left, then we will know what we took out. Because it's basically what we put in minus what is left after systole. That's going to end up being to us what we ejected, which is the stroke volume. And so... ESV, and then we're done with this, ESV is going to correspond to the end of T because this is systole, okay? I'm already excited. I'm not even kidding, okay? <laughs> this is systole. So we're pumping out, pumping out, pumping out. Basically, at the end of systole, there's our volume, and then we will know what we ejected during this, during this heartbeat. What we put in minus what is left, that is what we ejected. That's why stroke volume is EDV, what we put in, minus ESV, what is left. That's going to equal the stroke volume of what we eject. Again, sometimes it's easy to put numbers in so you kind of visualize it. Uh, you know, these, some of these numbers might be semi-accurate in general, too. Um, so if we were to calculate that, would you give us the number? Like, how yeah, 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 don't worry about all that. Okay. Right, because right now we just want conceptual, you know, conceptual. Yeah, I'll, if, I, if we have a problem on that, you know, I'll give you basically every number but one, you know, for that, for that formula. But that's like such a minor point, I don't even want to talk about math right now. Because I want to get this concept, start to get this concept in. So, what we're going to do now, and then that sets us up for what we're going to do in a little bit, is... Okay, let's not even talk about blood pressure, although we will in a minute. But we're talking about, let's just say, we want to increase cardiac output. You know, whether it's exercising or we want to build up blood pressure, it doesn't matter. We want to increase cardiac output. So we could start to see, well, what do we want to do? We can do, we can do one of two basic things here. We can do <coughs> increase heart rate or increase stroke volume. Of course, we can do both, but we control these separately, Okay. You know, we coordinate, but we control it separately so we have backups, right? We're not a one-trip pony. We want to make sure we've got a lot going on. So I want to show you, we're going to introduce, a, well, how do we do this? And so right now, let's just, we'll just do it this way, and we're going to erase this and make it more complicated. Let's say we want to increase cardiac output. Okay? One way is to increase heart rate. We all agree, right? That would, that would do it. We increase heart rate, increase cardiac output. Now, this is a little memory, but... It's, it's Monday. We talked about something from our nervous system, okay? A branch of our nervous system that could actually control, help control heart rate, uh, heart rate at the SA node, and that was the nervous system, control of heart rate, uh, which is part of what, what overall system? Was it the somatic motor neurons that control heart rate? 
Is it the autonomic sympathetic parasympathetic? Parasympathetic. And it's both. It's both. Okay? If you go back to that. Okay? Whether you look at this or, or the other, the idea is both of these are controlling it. Sympathetic will increase it, parasympathetic will decrease it, but again, you end up doing both. So that if you put heart rate, I'm always going to draw both, because you're not doing one or the other, you're just moving in opposite directions. Uh, because, wait, well, let's just do this. If, so if we want to increase heart rate, what are we going to do to sympath sympathetic stimulation on the SA node? What, is, what does sympathetic do? Does it speed it up or slow it down? Speeds it up. So okay. you're going to add normal. Right, and right now we won't even we won't even name the name it right now, but it's going to be. I mean, the sympathetic will that it, basically these are nerves that innervate the heart, okay? But they're the autonomic ones. So if we increase sympathetic stimulation, it is going to release norepinephrine. That's going to increase heart rate. But we're affecting. We don't just do that. We always operate both. You know, we have it like warm here. We're controlling hot and cold water. If, we're going to inhibit the inhibitor, so we are turning down parasympathetic, which is doing the same thing. Okay, if parasympathetic inhibits, you decrease the inhibitor, that also increases heart rate. So I'm always going to be drawing these together, and they're all, always going to be in opposition. So to increase heart rate, that's literally what we'll do. Increase sympathetic, decrease para. Increase heart rate, we increase cardiac output. Right? That makes sense. So what's the other thing we do? We can increase stroke fibers. So let's put this over here. But, let's look at these separately. Because we're going to control them separately. There's two kind of ways, based on this, that we can increase stroke volume. We can do what to EDV? Do you think? Well, maybe you don't quite know this, but we're going to get it, the idea of this. If we put more in, by increasing EDV, guess what? We're going to pump more out. And I'm going to show you kind of a law to do that. So let me kind of show you that. We have, but basically, I'm telling you that. I'm going to just put this up. I'm going to show you why and how. So if we put more in, that means we're increasing EDV. We're going to show you the mechanism of that's going to cause us to pump more out. Basically, if we can pump more blood or get more blood up so the heart fills up more, it's going to pump that excess blood out by a certain law we're going to go. So more in is going to mean more out. And I'm going to explain why and show you how. Okay? More in, more out. Now this one, ESV is what is left after we squeeze. And you just, you confirm with me that we don't squeeze everything out. It's like a sponge. <coughs> so if we want to increase stroke volume, what are we going to do to, what are we going to try to do in general? Squeeze, squeeze harder. So the ESV value is going to be, what is left is going to be less. Okay? So right now, we'll just put that up here. And we're just getting in on this. So we can do either of these or both. We can increase what we put in. And I'm going to show you how and why. Or we can decrease what is left. And we already actually said we're going to increase, and we'll show you how, increase the force of contraction. If we can increase the force of contraction, that means less is left and stroke volume will go out. Right now, I'm telling you, if we put more in, more is going to go out. So let's work on this one, okay? Show you why and how EDV is important. Why, if we put more in, more is going to go out. So i got to go forward. Okay, what we're doing now in the next 40 minutes, the most important part of the course until we do the kidney. And we're going to repeat this, you know, next week. But I want to have you thinking about it over the weekend. Okay, so, well, you know, I already have that part here. We already have that. But for this, it's going to be something called venous return I've got to explain. But let me show you this law, which is why if you put more in, you're going to, more is going to come out. Why I'm saying that over and over again, it kind of says it here. Don't worry, by the way, of interpreting this figure, except I have to have a picture on there. And I could have, you know, put a picture of some guy smiling, but I decided to put the actual picture of, of the uh, of sort of the, the, you know, the law working here. 
But it, again, this is the down one. But the idea of this is the fish throwing off is saying the more that comes in, the more that goes out. Now the key with this is, and this is the visual I want, is because another student, I had a student here who was in the Navy, and he had to take this, but he actually did those echocardiograms, and he taught cardiology, but he had to do this whole, I had him give a small lecture, and he said, when he's teaching, or he was explaining this way, that you want to think of the heart as basically, the mu this type of muscle is basically like, like you have these things on a rubber band, okay? And if, if it fills up, you're stretching the rubber band, and of course then it's going to come back and eject. What if you stretch more? The rubber band will break. Well, you got a strong rubber band. We have a strong heart. If you stretch more, what's going to happen? It's going to—it's basically going to go harder and eject what it put in. You put even more, even more, and that's what the Frank Sterling all because our our uh, cardiac muscles sort of work that way. They're like stretch kind of muscles. Uh, that basically, the more you stretch, the more that's going to cause the contract. And so, basically, what that basically means on this is the more blood we put in. The, basically, the more we're going to eject. It's basically the, the heart's going to return whatever gets, you know, where, or whatever goes to the heart's going to be ejected out. There's a couple ways to say it. But it's sort of that idea that if we can put more in, that's going to be, more is going to be ejected because of this stretch receptor, okay, idea of how that muscle works. The more in, the more out. If we, where's our example of numbers? Okay, so the idea with this is, if we put, again, we're not affecting ESV yet, okay, we're doing this separately, but if we put 160 in, okay, this is controlled separately, so we still uh, have 60 mils after we squeeze, uh, that means now we have 100 mils ejected. We put more in, we increased EDV. We didn't affect this one right now, we're going to, we'll do that later. Right now we're just showing, if we put more in, that, that excess that we're putting in is going to be ejected out because of the Frank Starling law. Okay? That's why when I say, or when we're playing it, excuse me, increase EDV, increase stroke volume of, of why it's working that way. So we eject more blood at a greater force. The, 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 a greater force. The, I, I don't want to use that term right now because, because the pressure itself the blood pressure won't necessarily change, okay, but that's, I don't want to say that, okay. I just, I guess because then I've got to really think closely on that before I misstate it. But we are going to eject that excess blood out. We're not going to keep it there. If we put more blood in, when we measure, when we measure how much got ejected systemically, uh, more is going to come out. So, because again, force, you know, are we dealing, we're not dealing with how, when we're actually causing the ventricle to contract, you know, when we're choking at that muscle, we're not talking about that increasing force because we're going to do that separately. We're just talking about just the natural way of the, of the way the heart, heart works. So I don't know if, if, if force is going to be the right term or not. It's simply going to basically make sure that we return to its original shape. So if, it sha if, if we put more in, when it returns to its original shape, it therefore has ejected more blood. Does that make sense? So I, don't want to, I just don't want to use the term force. Well, I know. I think maybe... I mean, I, maybe that's why she was confused, because you were talking about the rubber band, and you were saying it contracts harder whenever it's, like, comes you know, back to shape. Again, I, maybe so, but, but I... But do you I, mean just by, like, like say I if, put $100 in the bank. If I, if I put $20 in the bank, I can take $20 out. If I put $100 in, I can take $100 out. Are you just saying... Well, yeah, but except I don't like that analogy as much as, you know, in other words, whether, whether you want to do it with the force, the, the thing is, in other words, if, if you get the idea that the heart's going to return to its original shape, Okay, so if you put in, if, if normally it's, you know, it's doing its thing, if you put in where it's 50 more mils, it's going to get rid of that 50 mils, okay, than it normally is. If you put 100 more mils than it usually has, it's simply going to get rid of that excess so it's, it's back to its original shape. Uh, so, I, you know, maybe that force thing I can't use as much anymore. The, uh, but, but does everyone get the basic idea that, that the more we put in, it's going to eject that excess? Okay, so that we end up having, you know, what is the original one? That if we, if this was the way it's working before stimulation, and we had 140 and we had 60 left, if we put 160 in, that excess 20 is ejected. If we put 180 in, which is 40 more than that, that 40 more is being ejected as well. Whatever additional blood we put in is basically going to be ejected. It's not going to just stay there and start accumulating in the heart. Okay, it works because of the stretch receptor, but I just don't want to use force. How do we do this, Mike? Okay, 
Very important part, and that's why I drew the veins like this. Okay? The, what we want to do, and I'll show you why, is, I just put it up here. We want to do something very important called, to, to, in order to increase EDV, what we put in, we must increase venous return. And I'll tell you what that is in a moment. Uh, well, I'm going to tell you what it is right now. But there's going to be three ways that we can increase venous return. Can I get this here? So, just by this cartoon, or I can actually use the cartoon I want in a minute and come back to that. Uh, and I'm going to get to this up here in a second. But this picture I found is better than the one in the book that I found recently to help explain the difference between the arteries and the veins and why we were really big about venous return. Okay, so just, just you know, don't read any of this right now. Just look at this whole system drawn this way, and I try to sort of mimic it. If you look at the blood, okay, here's a heart. If you look at the blood in the arteries, okay, the arteries are pretty much like, you know, balloons, right? You, they're very elastic, okay? They're getting blood, but they're getting back down to the original size. They're not just sort of, you know, like a plastic bag filling up. And blood is basically creating pressure here, and it's enough pressure to get us through the arterioles and capillaries, etc. Now, when we, we drew the diagram before, what was the pressure in the veins? Remember, we had high blood pressure. In fact, I don't know if I have that real close. But we had bl highest blood pressure coming at the aorta, and then it was dropping, dropping, dropping. It was very, very, very low in the veins, right? It was near... Does everybody remember that? No. No. I know there's only a billion slides there, okay. <laughs> Maybe so. So, I'll make sure I remind myself. So this was one of the earlier ones. And this relates to, to the, what we're doing right now. So, the idea, when we looked at the mean arterial pressure, was highest coming out the aorta, pretty high in the arteries, and then as it went to the capillaries, you know, the pressure started dropping, and then we got to the veins all the way, you know, until we we're going to return to the heart. And the purpose of this, and, you know, in conjunction with this, would be the idea that pressure is very, very low in the veins. And therefore, you know, what we're going to see from this and the other one, our venous system is like a reservoir, okay? We're going to basically, of all of our blood, keep what we need to maintain a certain blood pressure, and then we have kind of a reservoir, very low-pressure blood in our venous system. Uh, and so two things come from that. One thing is, we've got to figure out a way to get that <coughs> blood back that's under really low pressure. What's our trick to get it back? What's our trick for venous return? That's going to be one thing. And then the other aspect will be the idea of how we're going to use this. And how we're going to use this is, if we don't need much blood out here, okay, you know, if our cardiac output is, doesn't need to be that high or sort of half sleeping and all that, we can keep a lot of blood in this, in this reservoir. But if we need to now increase our cardiac output to run away from that bear or to run to class or whatever, we're going to take some of that blood that's been sitting there in that reservoir and make sure we get it up to this compartment. Okay? So we have to increase venous return. This is venous return. What blood is being returned from the veins up into this arterial system? Okay? And that's, the, the, it's all the action, but it's how much we're going to return. So if we don't need much cardiac output, we're going at this pretty slowly. A lot of it's going to basically, okay, that's why I want to show this and come back to it. A lot of it is really just sitting in the venous reservoir under low pressure. We have just enough here in the arteries up to the tissues that we need. If we need to increase cardiac output to exercise or decrease blood pressure, we are going to make sure we've got to somehow squeeze this in a way, just if you think about it that way, so that some of this reservoir now is in this side of the coin, so we can do what we need to do. So two kind of different systems of uh, vessels here, arteries under high pressure, veins under low pressure, and a kind of a reservoir for our blood. <laughs> and that's why what we're looking at when we need to increase cardiac output, we've got to get that blood back. We need to increase venous return, the return of that venous blood to the heart and to the system. That's what venous return is going to refer to. 
So it's under low pressure. We've got to figure out a way to increase venous return. If we can, if we can increase venous return, we're going to get more to the heart. We're increasing EBV. If we increase EBV, what do we increase? Stroke fine, and therefore cardiac output, and that's our goal right now. So, again, so, venous return. How do we do this? Well, the first two ways uh, will make, make some, some sense to us. The third one, I've got to give one complication to it. So the idea of this is, and we can kind of look at this, this is showing the skeletal pump. It's called, it's basically the skeletal and respiratory muscle pumps. So I can actually just put that. Respiratory pump. And the third one I'm going to mention in a second. So these two are listed on this slide right here. So the one that's shown is the skeletal pump. So if you look at our veins, you know, they're running through our muscles. It's good to illustrate the leg ones because that's the one you're thinking, look, our, our venous blood is under low pressure and I've got gravity pushing it down. How am I going to get that back to the heart? Well, your muscles are surrounding these vessels and the veins have, you know, we're big on one-way valve. They have one-way valve. So that if you squeeze, when the muscles are contracting around the veins and pushing the blood, it has to push them up toward the heart. That the, the, the valves prevent backflow uh, down, <coughs> down the system here, as long as you don't have air going okay? So that, that's sort of the idea. So that means what we're doing, then you're going to relax the muscles, contract again. So that's why when you're talking about venous return, okay, with the skeletal pump, you're sort of thinking about squeezing the blood one valve at a time. You squeeze it, that blood went up to that one. That muscle squeezing it up here. It's basically, you know, it's, it's a little faster than that. But that's sort of the idea, that you're sort of just squeezing it up because of these one-way valves. So that's sort of the skeletal muscle pump. If you need more venous return, you know, you know skeletal muscle, but you start moving your muscles more, that's automatically squeezing more blood to the heart. That's the skeletal pump. That's one way, that's one method of venous return, I mean, that, that we're using all these, but if we're trying to increase it, well, we increase the activity of that. Okay? The second one, respiratory. It's a very similar mechanism. I just don't have a picture of it. You know, when we do the, the respiratory system, our lungs are in a thoracic cavity and diaphragm going up and down. We're literally doing what? We are creating pressures. We're creating, you know, a, a higher pressure, pushes air out, exhale. We're going to expand it, decrease pressure, air goes in. Okay? Well, our veins are going through there as well. And so what are you doing to your veins? Constricting, you know, less pressure. More pressure, less pressure. Which way is it going to go? Up to the heart, but one-way valves. So if you increase respiration, you're increasing that pump, increasing venous return, <coughs> therefore EDV, therefore stroke volume. Do those make sense? Okay? It has to do with one-way valves and that we can squeeze this blood back up to the heart basically by just operating, you know, our normal respiration and muscles. The third way, we have, and I'll show a better picture in the next chapter, that we're going to, re, we're going to revisit this, the sympathetic system, okay, here I am, the sympathetic system, but I have four arms, we'll see. Okay, we already have one arm going to the heart, okay, getting the heart rate, another arm goes to these veins. And so increasing sympathetic is going to cause vaso, I'm just going to say vaso, but it's going to be the veins, vasoconstriction. And by constri you know, I'm going to show the actual reason why. I used to go, you could think of the same way of squeezing, but we're literally going to end up in a way, because of this constriction of these, increasing venous return to the heart. And that's the third way, and you can see the sympathetic is going to already see, have a big part in what we're talking about today. So that's when we want to revisit this, and that's why I've got up top sympathetic, and it might not be in your handout, but it's in, your, it's in the PowerPoint. Is this, I added the slide last year because I kept talking, well, by, by basal constricting, we're squeezing <laughs> it back, and that, that really wasn't a full explanation. And so I had actually put the real explanation here, and it has to do with the term called compliance. And that's why it's, it's here and it's on, uh, it's on this PowerPoint. And that, it, it, it basically refers to what I was saying, but let's kind of get the term in, in context here. 
that the idea of compliance is thinking that if you're adding fluid, in this case blood, to, you know, to a vessel, uh, is it going to stay sort of rigid or is it sort of just going to collect the blood? Is it going to be like a balloon or is it going to be like a you know, plastic baggie? And so if you, put, you know, if you put water in a plastic baggie, what does it do? It just fills up. It's very compliant. It's not very elastic, okay? It doesn't, you know, push it basically come right back together, right? Basically, you fill up with water, okay? The arteries are not very compliant, and we'll see this will create blood pressure. It basically, it might fill up a little bit as the blood, as the blood's coming in, and then it's going to be like elastic and basically stay there. It's not going to collect blood. It's going to propel the blood forward. But when we get to the veins compartment, these guys are very compliant. As the blood enters this, it doesn't just immediately go back, it starts to sort of fill up. These, these vessels can actually take the blood, and, it, and as it's doing that, it's not returning to the heart as much, right? It's simply, it's basically more sitting in this compartment. I mean, this is an exaggeration. But that has to do with this idea of compliance. These vessels, not very compliant, they're very elastic. So expand, but get right back to push the blood. These are very uh, compliant. They're going to basically kind of, you know, dilate as the blood comes in and not get the blood back as fast. So by causing constriction, which is what the sympathetic is going to do, it's basically lowering that compliance so to, to make it more like that. So now as the blood comes in, instead of just building up like a plastic bag, it's going to return it quicker to the heart. That's increasing venous return. So it's changing compliance. I was just wondering, is that what you meant by those weird little... No. Okay. That's coming up. That will come up in the next chapter. That's going, to, that's going to be vasoconstriction of isodilation, but that's specifically going to be the arterial side. That's going to be up here, basically keeping more of the blood in for pressure or allowing more to go in and basically flow into this next compartment through the capillaries and all that. So those are going to be up here. Now, that's a relatively complicated term, but does everyone start to get the idea? Okay, right now, again, lots, lots of factoids going on, but do you kind of get the idea of of these different systems, and sort of right now, at least putting this down, that if we're trying to increase cardiac output, okay, we're, this will be one more thing on this, and then we're, we'll actually just combine this, take a couple minutes, and then redo this for the next chapter for blood pressure. But the idea is if we want to put more blood in, okay, if we want to increase end diastolic volume, which means more blood in, more blood out, then we have to get more back from the vein. The key word is venous return. So we're going to use the skeletal respiratory pump to pump it one valve at a time. We're going to have the sympathetic system innervate it, cause constriction of that. That basically means more of that blood's going to flow back. It's going to increase venous return. Don't worry. We're going to be going over and over. This is just getting us the basis for this. Increase force of contraction. Okay, we said that for ESV. Okay, we want to increase the force of contraction. You know who's going to do that? I'll just put it here and then we'll actually show you later. Sympathetic as well. And we'll show you it in the next chapter. Sympathetic goes to the, to the, to the heart muscle. When it, when it hits it, boom. For much stronger a squeeze. Stronger squeeze of contraction. So you can already see, and we're just going to redo this on a much better figure, that sympathetic system affects actually every one of these terms. You know, sympathetic system, you know, simulation is going to help us increase heart rate. It's going to help us increase venous return and EDV and therefore stroke biome. It's going to cause heart contraction so that we eject more, more stroke biome and more cardiac output. So the parasympathetic is only going to do one thing. We're going to see the sympathetic is going to do four things because it's going to get over here too. But right now we sort of have three of them. Okay. Look at that, copy it down, and then forget the rest of chapter 14. Actually, there really is nothing of chapter 14 I want to talk about anyway. We're, all, we're automatically going to go to 15. But we're going to go to 15, and on your handout, go all the way until you see this, this, this segment called barrel receptors. So this is chapter 15. This is what we're going to do. We're just going to repeat this, but we're going to do it in a very complete way that's going to be, again... The, the most important thing in the next three weeks of your life. So it's kind of important. In fact, I'll go ahead. While you're doing that, I'll even put that slide up so you sort of see kind of uh, where, where you want to look at your handout or if you've got to PowerPoint slides.
Again, maybe open the, the door too. Well, let me just show that figure, which is near there. Because that's, that's going to be the key where we start with. I'm going to get some air in here. Um. I'm going to keep this up. It's cold. Well, I'm going to get it. It's getting too stuffy, or right? maybe I'm moving a lot. We can always erase it in a minute. Okay, and we're going we're to just do this a much better way in a minute. But does anybody need, does everybody have whatever they want for that side? Are you good? Because we're going to make a much better one. You're going to need, a, you're gonna need a, a complete piece of paper. Okay, because what I'm drawing on the board isn't specifically written down in your notes like that. It's going to be a complete piece of paper that you're going to basically do a thousand times before we're done. And it's not a memorization thing you're going to see. It's going to make some logical sense. Okay? And that's all we're going to have to do today, but it's important. So is everybody, at least if you have, if you have your handout, slash PowerPoint. Has everybody sort of got to the middle there where you've got a slide like that and you have this thing called barrel receptors? Kind of a couple words on that. Sort of in the middle of the handout. Again, the, the key is to look for that figure because it's right around there. That's the one you can kind of sit. <coughs> okay? Now, so, right before that, I'm gonna go. I'm gonna. I'm gonna be here. In fact, we're not gonna even have to look at anything else but this when I do it on the board. But uh, I just want to show this, okay? Because this this is what I'm talking about as as far as why I drew this right here. Uh, and again, this is a better picture. But overall, it is this idea that we're talking blood pressure here, and we'll talk about calculating mean arterial pressure. But it's cardiac outputs putting the blood in. And here is this idea of these arterioles is, is creating resistance, all right? So that if we've, if we've already got the idea that we understand it. If we vasoconstrict these, that's going to keep the blood in and increase the balloon. If we dilate them, that's going to lower blood pressure because we're talking about control of blood pressure. So we've already mentioned the cardiac output side, which is going to be the major thing we're going to do now too. But there's also now this side as well that we're going to basically have as its own column. We're going to draw columns here showing you if we need to increase blood pressure what, or decrease it, what are we going to do to these? Everything else is going to involve what we do to cardiac output. So that's why that's there, but you have this. This, by the way, again, just like probably there's not going to be an essay question drawing all this, but you're probably going to put it on your test to answer those multiple choice questions involved in this. This it's going to help us do what we're going to do on the board. Because you're going to see this is a very, I'm not a very anal person, as you can probably tell, but, but I'm very anal on this, of putting these in the exact order so I know you understand that increasing EDV increases stroke volume and therefore cardiac output and their blood pressure. So this is going to be a very linear list, as we're going to see. So to do this, I'm going to use this. You're never going to look at these the way they the way they do it. They got half charts here. Okay, we're going to use this. And what I'm going to do, and we're going to look at this for a second, is I'm going to talk about control blood pressure, and I'm going to list it in five columns of what's going to happen. And the idea, that, and you'll see why. The whole idea of this is the following: that we have blood pressure receptors. Okay, these are barrel receptors. Just like we had sensory receptors that brought information in, we have internal receptors to monitor our homeostatic you know, mechanisms, including blood pressure. These barrel receptors are in two major places, the aorta and the carotid artery, which makes sense, okay, coming out of the heart into the brain. So they're going to basically constantly, they're tonic, right? They're going to monitor pressure changes, send that information up to the cardiovascular uh, system in, you know, in the medulla, and it says, we're going to react to, to compensate and restore homeostasis. If blood pressure drops, the signal is, let's increase blood pressure. If our blood pressure you know, gets too high, it's going to signal, let's lower blood pressure. This happens, by the way. It's not like we're waiting like, oh, okay, it's too low. This is, 
you know, as you breathe in and out, your blood pressure is changing. This, this baroreceptor response is basically uh, taking that into account, changing your heart rate, changing everything we're doing constantly. And you'll see that in lab. You'll monitor your, your EKG, your heart rate, during inhalation, exhalation, you'll see a difference in heart rate. That's how quick this is. But the idea of this is, and this is where we'll kind of start this chart here, that we have basically, and I'll actually put something here, but baroreceptors are going to be the receptors which are going to monitor, detect blood pressure changes, and then restore balance. Again, baroreceptors, they are located in the aorta and carotid artery. Now, the, the way they're going to do this, okay, they're going to detect a change and try to, and try to correct. But the way they're basically going to do that, I'm going to put this here, is you know, they go to the brain, they are signaling the autonomic nervous system. That is what they're going to signal the medulla to do. Change the balance of sympathetic parasympathetic. That's why here, you know, I'm going to put like, you know, the example we're going to give, but all I'm going to put is sympathetic para. And once we decide what we want to do, one arrow is going up, one arrow is going down, just like we were talking about. But this is why this is going to have five columns. <coughs> reason is this. When we look at the response here, now this is a great picture to show it, we see that the parasympathetic innervates only one place out of this whole thing, the SA node, and therefore is affecting heart rate. But check out sympathetic, overachiever here, sympathetic goes to the SA node and affects heart rate. It goes to the ventricles, squeezes harder, affects stroke volume that way, right? It goes to the veins, squeezes them, increase venous return. It goes to these arterioles, squeezes them, affects it over here too. That's why it's, we're going to show you all these effects as five columns. One column is specifically how parasympathetic is affecting it, and then each one for each, you know, of the sympathetic of where it's affecting. Okay, and we're going to do it very, very linear. So, the... Uh, well, let's just do an example. Actually, there's only two examples. We're either going to have low blood pressure, in which we need to raise it, or we have high blood pressure, in which we need to lower it. It's going to be the exact same chart, but all the arrows will be reversed. So let's do one example, one specific example. Don't, again, don't look at their stuff, okay? Look at just what I'm just putting up there. So one type of low blood pressure, just one type, is called orthostatic hypotension. So if you're sort of laying down and you jump right up, you know, how you can kind of be dizzy? Well, that's because you have temporary low blood pressure because blood is pulled down and we have not enough getting to the brain. That's got a specific term, orthostatic hypotension. So, you know, if you do that, you know, who detects that? Okay, so you have orthostatic hypotension by doing that. So what in our body is going to detect that? What's, what's our sensors? Barrel receptors, okay? They are located carotid and carotid. And right now, this is important overall because you're going to refer to this. You've got to remember then, what is the goal going to be? What's our goal? What's what's our overall goal? To increase blood pressure. Increase blood pressure. And that becomes important or else when you're doing all this, you'll get lost into the details. You always want to do that. Now, the, the next thing to do is just determine this, because that's all it is. Okay, one's going up, one's going down. If we want to increase blood pressure, which one is going up? Boom. That's what we're going to use to fill this in. But that, if you can't, if you don't do that, then everything doesn't make sense. But that's literally from, again, from this, from this idea of what happens. That blood pressure is being detected here. Okay, if blood pressure drops. It's sending a message up to the medulla, it's going to increase sympathetic and decrease para. Because we already figured out, you know, already halfway that that's the right direction. So far, so good? Now, while we're filling this chart out, this becomes really important. You actually have to know what neurotransmitter, I'm putting NT, is being released, and because we're going to put these columns for it, and what are the receptors? 
So we're going to fill this in. That's going to become important as you're going to see this week and next week as well. So we're going to do each one, of, you know, we're going to pick each one at once uh, at a time and, and go through specifically what is happening to increase, to, to reach our goal. So again, I do this by convention. You know, I basically do this, 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 you know, to go across because my brain's used to it. I mean, they're all happening simultaneously. So the first one I want to do is that we are decreasing parasympathetic to the SA node. Because that's the only place, put that as one, that's the only place the parasympathetic is innervated. So the first thing is, what is the neurotransmitter that's being released? You may actually have said it before. Acetylcholine. So ACH. Now, it's skeletal muscle, ACH cause increased contraction. But we already know now this decreases heart rate. We already talked about that because it has different receptors. Back in the day, when we were talking about skeletal muscle and drugs, guess what it was called? Nicotinic. Think of that nicotine, how it was an agonist. These are called muscarinic. And you need to know these because we're going to have muscarinic antagonists or agonists. And so you have to know those are the receptors. Acetylcholine binds to muscarinic receptors on the SA node. Okay? So when you decrease parasympathetic, why is SA node right there? No, because we've got to show you where it is. Oh. Okay. okay? So that's the only place that it's going to have an effect, is how much neurotransmitter it's releasing on the SA node. How do you spell it? M-E-S-C-A-R-I-N-E. <laughs> Well, you know, in other words, it's like you know, we talked about synapses, right? It's synapses upon the SA node and then releases acetylcholine. On the SA node are the muscarinic receptors. So it's just like we kind of just did for the other ones, but that's sort of how it's working. Okay, now, now the key is to, to understand the order of things how I want. You literally are going to this, okay? Now we're looking at this thing. So when we're going to the SA node... Okay, well, when we're thinking of the SA node, what are we affecting? Are we affecting stroke volume or heart rate? Heart rate. Heart rate. So now you have to think. If we're decreasing the amount of para, what are we doing to heart rate? Decrease. We're, we're decreasing an inhibitor. Oh, increase. Increasing. Okay, now come over here. This is the, what I'm trying to get as a linear idea. If we increase heart rate... We're over here now. You're looking directly at this on your paper right now. If we increase heart rate, what are we also there for increasing? Stroke volume. No. Oh. No. Okay. Cardiac output. We're dealing with that separately. But this is just like a math problem, right? This times this. We can increase either. By doing SA node, we're increasing heart rate. If you increase heart rate, you increase cardiac output. If you increase cardiac output, you increase blood pressure. And that's what I want here. Increase heart rate. Therefore, we increase cardiac output. Therefore, we increase blood pressure. Was that our goal? Yes. yes. That means we're done with that column. So that's why this, you know, if we'll see when we fill this out, if you're memorizing that some random thing, it's just like forget it. But if you're following the logic here, it's going to become a lot easier. That's why this is pretty important. So this is what happens in orthostatic hypotension? This is one-fifth of what happens during orthostatic hypotension or any kind of hypotension when it comes down to that. Uh, any kind of low blood pressure. This is immediately going to kick in. And we're going to have less parasympathetic going. That's going to increase heart rate, therefore cardiac output, and therefore blood pressure. Now, all other four columns, sympathetic, innervating those four places and releasing their neurotransmitter. Now, so, and that's why I'm doing, I got that out of the way. And so, just, just to kind of get us here, the, I can actually, I'm not going to put the receptors yet. Well, I won't even do anything. Then we'll just, we'll, we're going to just do this in order. So on this one, we're going to, one, we're going to increase sympathetic onto the SA node. Remember, when sympathetic is being stimulated, it's increasing it onto all of these, but we're taking one at a time. So sympathetic innervates, it increases sympathetic to the SA node stimulation. Now, it's a neurotransmitter. Norepinephrine. Okay, I'm putting NE for abbreviation. The receptors 
On the essay no. Beta 1. Anybody here beta blockers? We're going we're gonna to see why we need to know these receptors. They're beta 1 receptors. Okay? Norepinephrine on beta 1 receptors, we're increasing that to the SA node. Okay? We're on the SA node. What are we affecting if we're looking at the SA node? And what are we doing to heart rate? And if we increase heart rate, what do we increase? And therefore, so these should look the same way because we're just doing it. We're tweaking one up, tweaking one down to create the same effect. Increase heart rate, therefore increase the cardiac output, and therefore we've increased our blood pressure by this method, but we do both. Okay? In this case, that's why they both innervate the SA node. They're tweak one up, tweak one down to have the same effect. If you do this and you've got up as a result, you've done something wrong. But does everyone see, it's SA no, it's heart rate, cardiac output, therefore blood pressure. Now we got a couple stroke volume columns, okay? So three and four are because where we're going to go are the ventricles and the veins. That's why we just introduced that. <coughs> so let's move there. And we're going to increase sympathetic to, these are the ventricular muscles. It is the same neurotransmitter, and in this case, the same receptors, beta 1. Make sure you put 1, because there's other ones that we'll talk about next time. Beta 1. Okay? So, your beta 1 receptors on the heart for the sympathetic, both places. But now, we're not affecting heart rate. Okay? We've done that. Over here, we're going to affect, okay, if they're on the muscle, what are they going to affect? But specifically right now, they're affecting the force of contraction. That's why I was afraid to use force before, because here we definitely are, are affecting the force of contraction. And so what we're going to do, and, and, and you can kind of imagine, because already, which way it's going to go. If you're increasing sympathetic, what do you get to, it's either going to cause more or less force. What do you think? <coughs> so it doesn't exactly matter exactly how you say this, but we're increasing uh, you know, ventricular force, force of contraction. Just so you get the idea. I'll put ventricular force of contraction, I guess. So, does everybody see that? Okay, they believe that. They believe it, right? Now, now to get the rest of these, we come over here. And the key with doing this right is, you know, we don't say, well, that increases cardiac output and blood pressure, I've got a date. No, no. We've got to be anal, we've got to start exactly where this starts, and then don't skip a step. So, we look at this equation, this whole thing here. If we're increasing contractile force, what specific term are we affecting? The most specific you can get. EDV. Does everybody, and again, if you don't, you know, this is like, you know, we just want to get the basis of this. But that, remember we were talking about, well, no, we're talking about the force is going to affect ESV. Remember we talked about squeezing. You know, can we squeeze the sponge harder? This is going to squeeze the sponge harder. So this one, we're, we're basically talking about ESV. What is left? Okay, are we going to have, are we, we're squeezing harder. If we squeeze harder, are we going to have more or less left? Less. less. So ESV is going down. Less is left. Okay? Now, if less is left, what have we done? What have we done to stroke volume? Does everybody see if less is left, we increase stroke volume? If we increase stroke volume, what have we increased? Cardiac output. If we increase cardiac output? Don't put heart rate in the middle there, half point off, because we're not. This is not directly affecting that. We did that in the first two columns. We're going to squeeze harder. Less is left. Therefore, greater stroke volume, greater cardiac output, greater blood pressure. Are we done with that column? Yes. Greater stroke volume. Therefore, now everyone kind of has these last steps. Kind of greater cardiac output. Don't skip anything. Greater blood pressure. Okay. These are separate components. Okay, we squeezed harder, ESV has gone down, stroke volume up, cardiac output up, blood pressure up. Shaking heads, yes. Now, now we're to, look where we are to finish up. Okay, again, this is the first time you've seen this, and you're going to write this 150 times and just know this, and already I think 
you see the logic of it already. Now, veins and arteries. It's on the veins and arteries. We'll do veins first. So let's increase sympathetic to the veins. Norepi, norepinephrine, but alpha receptors. Are beta blockers working on alpha receptors? No, we're going to talk about different drugs. Alpha antagonists, beta 1 antagonists are blockers. They have different effects. Okay, That's why we have to know this. So it's alpha receptors. Now, whenever we're doing, the, and by the way, just so you can complete this, guess what? On the arterioles, which will be the last one, it's also alpha receptors. So we'll just kind of get that and, you know, increase sympathetic to arterioles. Because those are the last two places. So on the arterioles, sympathetic is going there. They're both using alpha receptors. Okay, no one has to go on those. But we're just on the veins. And we just did that. This is the hardest column coming up. But we're going to get through it. Okay? Yeah. Okay? And then five's the easiest. Well, these are pretty easy. All right. So, but this, this one, we've got to follow this. But we've already, we've already previewed it. So, whenever you're doing these, whenever you're talking about veins and arteries, the next thing you're thinking of, it's going to do one of two things. It's vasoconstriction or vasodilation. That's, that's your next thing, because that's what it's doing to them. So, if you, and we've done this, but let's see, remember, if we increase sympathetic to the veins, what is it going to do to them? Okay, vasoconstriction. It constricts them. Sympathetic to the veins, it causes vasoconstriction or increases that. Now, one other term you need before you go to that equation is, if you increase, we just said this, but we're going to get it out. If we increase the, 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 the venous constriction, the vasoconstriction, we are going to increase blood pressure. Now, see, that's when you have, a, like, a date to try to get to, right? That's step eight, okay? You increase what? The venous EDB. Venous return. We've got to get the venous return. Then we can get over there to EDB and we'll be over there. That's why this one, you got you have a couple things before you get to that equation. Because if you draw this whole thing, it might, might help. But those are the terms you have to get overall. You remember sympathetic, and you're going to remember, by the way, it's, you know, it's pretty easy to remember vasoconstriction after a couple of times. But you can't forget this. If you end up forgetting on the essay, it's like a half a point, right? It's like you got a lot of things here. But you want to get this concept that by causing this constriction, because of what I said before, you increase what comes back to the heart. That is really important, this term. You'll read a lot about venous return controlling blood pressure. So three is we're increasing venous return by constricting these veins. Now we go to the equation. <coughs> and someone's already said this. Now we're looking, we're going specific to general. If we are increasing venous return, what are we increasing first? How much we put in. Okay? That's why you, you want to start, I mean, right now it's a lot, but you want to start making sure it gets to a logical order. If we're returning more in by increasing venous return, that's EDV. We're putting more blood in. That's how we're putting more blood in. Skeletal muscle pump, respiratory pump, but in this case, by causing this constriction, more venous return, that means more in. EDV is going up. Now, according to Frank Starling, if EDV goes up, what goes up? which is stroke volume. If stroke volume goes up, what goes up? And therefore, so now we're following. Once we get through this, it's like when you make this connection, we've increased what we put in, EDV. Therefore, we've increased what we eject, stroke volume. If you increase stroke volume, you increase cardiac output. If you increase cardiac output, you increase blood pressure. Are we done with that fun column? Yes. Yes. Okay? So, you're increasing sympathetic to the veins, that's constricting them, that's increasing venous return, therefore, more is coming in, EDV's up, more comes in, more gets ejected, stroke volume, that means more cardiac output, more blood pressure. The easy one to finish off for the first time. The easy one is over here, okay? We have that fifth, fourth branch of the sympathetic. It's going all the way to these arterioles and, again, affecting the constriction or dilation of them. 
Uh, and I've already said it uses the same receptors, alpha receptors, and of course, in every case, it's using norepi. So we've increased sy sympathetic uh, uh, stimulation of the arterioles, and therefore, what does that cause you? Hey, constriction or dilation? Okay. Well, 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 let's think. First of all, when you think about this, what is our goal? Okay, to increase blood pressure, what do you think we want to do? Do we want to squeeze this or open it up? Look, look at this. This is you want to think of this. That's why the cartoon of the balloon, the balloon filling up, is blood pressure. So, do you want to allow it to to exit, or do you want to keep it in? Does everyone see? We sort of want to constrict this and increase something that we call peripheral resistance. which is, we'll abbreviate that PR. Basically, if these arterioles are very uh, constricted, that means the blood can't get out very much. There's a lot of resistance. It stays here. That increases blood pressure. If we dilate them, now there's not as much resistance. More of the blood's going out. Blood pressure goes down. So in this case, we know our goal is to increase blood pressure. So increasing sympathetic to these arterioles is going to cause them to, to do what? Constrict or dilate? Constrict. Constrict. What does that do to peripheral resistance? What's that do to blood pressure? See, we're done. So let's put it up here. We've increased sympathetic to the arterioles. This has caused vasoconstriction of those guys. Therefore, increased PR, peripheral resistance. Therefore, increased blood pressure, boom, okay? So this is control blood pressure. If we did the opposite, if we had uh, uh, high blood pressure that we're trying to lower, this would be the exact same thing, arrows reversed, and of course, just constriction meant to dilation. The exact same thing. The order doesn't change. Nothing changes except the, 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 that we, we start right up here of switching those, and all those get switched. So this again, you know, and you can copy it right now or you know, take photographs or whatever, is what you want to practice on because not only is this whole thing, your 14 point or so essay question, it's going to answer 30 points of other ones and set us up for a lot more than that. Because again, we're going to talk about a lot of critical thinking based upon this so that when you go to your test and write that right away on the back because you've been doing it 100 times and you're going to do it 101 times and put it on the back and you go to the multiple choice and you're trying to figure it out, you're like, Wait a minute, he's asking about this, you know, involving, you know, some sort of, con you know, contraction or EDV. Okay, I know that, I have that here. And it's not something I'm memorizing. This should start to, after you do it a while, start to maybe make some sense as well. The key is, if, you know, if you just try to do that from the note card, I don't really get that. If you use this and help guide you through, I think that's going to help. So, this is, again, really cool. Okay, it's a lot of information. But it's, again, we're going to, we'll, we'll just start off next time with it and, make, and see what questions we have on that. Try to work on this over the, over the week. So, you, you know, you want to come in Monday knowing this, okay? So practicing this so that when we add other, other features, this, this is a complicated uh, section here, then it won't be totally everything new. So, and come with questions for me then, too. But that's about it. So, you know, we'll start about five after, maybe, or so. So you have 15 minutes. Uh, to try to regroup for, for taking the, uh, the lab test tonight. And if what you're doing with the lab test, you go, there is no lab. I'm not sure. Yes. But you're sympathetic.